been um, sort of a suggestion that's been raised in some of these debates about, you know, that would lead some to believe that crime is on the rise in Fall River, you know, and, and that public safety is an issue. And I, I was just wondering if you had th th any thoughts on that one way or the other. Sure. Um, well, as you saw from the, uh, the re most recent stats, the year-end report, um, violent crime we actually saw some pretty good de decreases in, um, in violent crime. Um, we find that most of uh, the robberies are uh, drug-related. People either in, uh, in looking to buy drugs or engage in a drug deal, getting robbed. Um, not all, but, but most. And we have significant decreases in business robberies. So I think um, what happens is when, when there's an election or a, a serious incident happens, it, it, brings it, it brings it to the forefront and people remember the most recent incident. So when nothing's going on, there's nothing to remember. So um, I think that's why the perception gets out there that all of it is unsafe or getting unsafe or crime is rising. In fact, it's not, not the case. Yeah. And like some of the recent high profile cases, you know, I can think of the, you know, the, the shots fired incident downtown. Mm -hmm. I think it was a case where a couple of teenage girls got arrested for like a bank robbery. Right. Um, the, there was a homicide not that long ago also of a mm -hmm. teenager. Um, so yeah, so like yeah, I guess that does feed a perception that you know that vi that violent crime is you know is is on the rise right. or that these kind of crimes are becoming more common. But you're saying that the numbers don't don't seem to don't don't seem to suggest that right they, they don't support like so those cases um the daylight shooting and, and uh, obviously we don't want those things to happen uh, in response to that to try to prevent that from happening again and other drive-by shootings retaliation or anything like that we've increased uh, the number of officers in our gang unit to uh put some pressure on gangs and it's going to continue it's not in the past we've reacted to these um incidents and uh, this time we're not just going to react, we're going to be proactive, we're going to leave those officers there and we're going to try to get the intelligence and, and get people off the street before these types of incidents happen. As far as the bank robbery, uh, it, it's kind of an anomaly. Our bank robberies are way down. Um, that particular incident was just two kids that really never, never should have happened. How do you prevent something like that? Um, and the murder, we've had two murders this year. Both occurred indoors, people that were known to each other. Um, not gang related, not robbery related, not so. Again, how do you prevent something like that? Um, uh, the average person doesn't need to worry about uh, being attacked like that in their home by by strangers or anything of that nature. So um, the numbers again support that there's been some uh, good work done. There's been decreases, and we continue. We hope to continue that. And um, in. The 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 recent debate that Father Reporter hosted, there was a question about, you know, about what drives violent crime or what what drives crime in Fall River, and uh, and you know I thought it was a good question, so I wanted to ask you that as well. I mean, like, what seems to drive most of the crime in the city? Most of it's drug related, um, either people that are uh, addicted to drugs committing crimes so they can support their habit, or um, again violence between. You know, two gangs that are in, engaged in drug dealing, and that's where we see most of the crime coming from. Um, the other, the other thing that's driving up some numbers is more awareness. I believe, like this, our sexual assault numbers were up, and I believe that's due to more awareness of uh, what a sexual assault is, um, and that people now, because of the media attention, people aren't as afraid to come forward, and uh, not as afraid that they're not going to be believed. So. Um, it doesn't uh, when that doesn't drive that doesn't drive the actual crime itself, but it drives the reporting of the crime, which will cause crime to look like it's increasing. When in fact the crime's always there, people just were under it was underreported. Okay, and I know we recently talked about you know increased patrols in the downtown area. I know uh, as well as some extra money given for overtime. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other initiatives that the police department is going to be is going to be looking at this year? Um, to address certain, you know, certain uh, public safety issues. So as I mentioned, uh, increasing the number of officers in the gang unit, we're going to, we're going to also increase the number of officers in the um, vice and intelligence unit. We had seven uh, officers graduate a few weeks ago from the academy, and um, as soon as they're done with field training, 
and can be uh, utilized elsewhere where you go um, increase some officers in the vice unit. And we're looking at possibly increasing some uh, the t officers in the major crimes division. Um, the, the thought being that if we can catch people when they commit their first crime rather than their second or third, that will have an impact on, on crime. So those, those are the, some of the things that we're doing right now in addition to um, using, uh, we have a crime analyst now. So um, she puts out a daily bulletin, uh, some weekly statistics, and uh, gathers a lot of in information that is now being more widely spread throughout the department. So more people are aware, are aware of who we're looking for or where the crimes are being committed so we can be more proactive. Hmm. And like, what kind of information, again, does the crime analyst sort of, like, what does the analyst do exactly? And what does he or she, what kind of information do they give the officers? So she'll go through the reports every day. She'll look for patterns. Um, if the suspects are similar, or um, uh, location, day, you know, time of day, day of week, that kind of thing, if it's similar. So that officer will have an idea of where a crime is likely to occur so that they can pay some attention to that. And in addition, uh, when people are wanted, she gets together the pictures, the posters, if they haven't been done yet. And she puts it all in a daily bulletin so it gets out to the entire department. And then she does our year-end report that, uh, that you've seen. She does, um, she also does a CompStat report, so a weekly report that highlights the most serious crimes and what the stages of the investigation are and what information is needed. And then she and uh, members of the command staff meet and they, they you know, discuss these crimes and information gets shared back and forth. We bring in some people from probation and parole um, they're there every week, so they share information and uh, sometimes, uh, well, often it's useful. You know, and um, I know we, we, we I know we talked also before about Shot Spotter, and now the last that we left it, I believe, um, the the company was being given a, a chance to get the system right. So I, I was curious, where do we stand now regarding Shot Spotter? Yeah, so we haven't had Shot Spotter since uh, June of uh, 2018. Um, they were, yes, you're right, they were given a chance to, uh, to address the deficiencies in the system and um, then there was an incident on Valentine's Day uh, in the corner where Morgan and South Main where a man was shot, killed, and ShotSpotter failed to detect the shots. Now, ShotSpotter wouldn't have prevented that murder, but just the fact that in broad daylight there was a shooting and ShotSpotter didn't react kind of uh, show us what direction we needed to go in because we solved that crime through video. So um, we decided not to renew the contract with ShotSpotter um, and we uh, actually have a plan right now to put in video over a good portion of the city. Um, it's a multi-year, multi-stage plan. The city council recently approved some funding um, for infrastructure for that uh, program and we're looking at putting out probably 24 cameras uh, by the end of the year. If not so Okay. All right. So ShotSpotter has been so ShotSpotter has not been used since last June, and there's no plan to bring it back now. It's, it's no. That when, when we looked at ShotSpotter and what, how it was working for the city, we found that um, it was giving us a lot of false positives, false calls that was wasting police resources. And we also never had a, a, a situation where there was an actual shots fired call where we didn't get notified by other means, uh, a person calling 911, for example. So just for the cost that, what it was costing the city and the benefit that we were getting from it, um, we feel that going into the direction of getting cameras, um, we'd rather put that money into cameras where we have some actual evidence that we can use in uh, solving crimes. Okay. And uh, I know I've written before that, you know, that the department, just like other police departments across the state, really never in some ways hasn't recovered completely from those the, those mass layoffs and I think it was 2000 you know, 2009 mm -hmm. given the state budget cuts and um, so um, how, I was curious for to ask you about you know like how much progress do you think the department has made since then in in gaining back some of that lost manpower and like how much more it, like ideally what, what, what kind of manpower do you think the police department needs to effectively police a city of Lake Fall River? So um, the layoffs resulted in uh, us having to cut services to people. So when we, when we talk about uh, recovering from that, there's two sides to it. It's getting people back, the officers back, 
um, on the job and getting those services back. So, for example, a safety officer. You might people will remember when they were in school, the safety officer come talking about traffic safety or um, things like that. So that's a position that still has not been filled. Um, so on that side, as we get more people, that's when we'll start to bring these services back. As far as people, uh, a few years back, three or four years ago, we were budgeted at 225 uh, officers. That's total from the chief to the you know, police officer. Um, this year we were budgeted for 237. And the only um, issue that we're running into now is finding available academy space to, to get people trained, um, hired and trained. Takes uh, six months in the academy, and then there's 12 weeks of field training. Um, so it's a, it's a long process. The hiring process itself can take from from the time we ask for names from civil service for a list until we actually get someone that can work on their own. It's almost a year um, because it's just a long involved process. So we keep working towards that. And uh, the other limitation we have is our field training program can only support about eight to ten officers at a time. So for us to hire any more than that is just not it's not effective. And then the, the, they lose out in the training uh, program. I know, like you know, people I, I often talk to in you know in the city, you know, say they, they like to see more offices, you know, on patrol beats or walking beats on, mm -hmm. on the streets, talking, you know, talking to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, uh, given the nature of police work today, responding to calls, especially opioid calls and you know and domestic violence calls how realistic is it to have like a lot of more offices on a walking beat you know in like neighborhoods to talk to people i think it's it's uh, feasible um again it's uh, one of the services that we had to cut down on um just that a, a walking officer can't cover as much ground as a uh, as an officer in, in a car so if there's an emergency and they need to get there um, i'd rather have them in a car so what we did in, in response to that is we have officers that go to all the neighborhood group meetings, and that's where they can get some interaction. We do have uh, CDA officers in certain areas of the city that do walk a good portion of their uh, shift, and um, we have an officer that does uh, walk and beat downtown during the week. Um, so that's been well received by the businesses down there. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I would like to bring back. Um, we also have money in the, built into the budget to do uh, targeted walking beat patrols when the weather, usually do that when the weather's nicer because there's more people out and there's, uh, we just get more out of it. And, you know, if someone's walking around in the winter down at the waterfront, there's not going to be that many people around for them to uh, interact with or any you know, crimes to prevent. So um, we do that. But as time goes on and we get more people, as I said, we'll, then we'll start to reassign these walking beats. So that um, it's just a matter of manpower right now. Got it. You know, and again, given how prevalent, again, just to, to, to go back to the the opioid you know, epidemic, how prevalent heroin and, and, and now fentanyl is, just how difficult is it for, you know, especially the frontline offices to to fight this, you know, going from treating the person with Narcan to responding to crimes that are driven by addiction just how challenging just how difficult is it you know to you know to have to deal with, with something like that right it's it's very difficult for the, the entire department because it's a, just a drain on the resources that we have available so um, it cuts down on the amount of time officers can actually patrol and uh, be pro more proactive and, and you know, look for problems before they actually happen um, because they're tied up on these other calls uh, so it's difficult for them going from call to call to call, uh, and almost every call being some type of an emergency, um, whether it is an overdose or it's a domestic or whatever it happens to be. Um, it's just, yeah, it can be challenging to be very busy and, and it doesn't allow for much uh, proactiveness. And I think that will impact your, your crime rate mm -hmm. on, the, on the other end. And like another com common complaint uh, I hear from people in the community about about public safety is regarding, um, you know, what they see as leaning in judges who give light bails and people go, you know, are back out on the streets after being arrested to, to sentences that are too late. And from the police department perspective, is that a problem? You know, sort of the the quote unquote revolving door sort of aspect of the, like of the system. Uh, it's a problem. Uh 
for whatever reason they're released i you know i won't presume to criticize any judge or, or any prosecutor that you know cuts a deal or um, looks for lighter sentences because i don't know all the facts of all those cases but yes the people that are repeat offenders are make up a good per percentage of the people that we deal with and arrest every year so if, if they're not incapacitated and, and in jail then they're out committing crimes and that's when we have to deal with them so it definitely has an impact on our resources